Okay. Hey, everybody. This is Chris Vagos. I'm the wildlife biologist from Stuart B. McKinney National Wildlife Refuge. Today, Anna Lee Mears is going to present um, about uh, shorebirds and shoreline preservation or conservation. Um, I'll let her do any introductions as far as like her background and things like that, because I think she has that in, in her presentation already. <laughs> um, she's our shorebird intern here and has been working at the refuge all summer long, as well as um, with the state on a lot of our um, state parks and on private beaches um, on the lookout for birds like American oyster catchers and piping plovers. And so she can tell you a little bit more about that. All right, take it away, Annalie. All right, yeah, I'll, I'll be um, going over some of that as part of the presentation. Um, as for a little bit of background on me, I graduated last year in 2020 uh, with a marine sciences degree, a bachelor's of science in marine sciences. Um, there's not too much interesting about me. I've done an internship with uh, shark husbandry in 2018. This is my second internship that's focusing more on a uh, data collection and conservation aspect of science. Um, I haven't been doing this in a professional capacity for too long. Um, very excited that I was able to have this opportunity. Uh, most of my, my background consists of just taking interest, learning about it, being out in the uh, environment. So I think we can go ahead and start with the presentation. Um, I'm going to share the screen uh, as soon as I am able to. Here we go. So that should work. perhaps. Very nice. And my only concern is I need to be able to advance the slides. Please excuse me, this is having some issues for me. Just gonna change everything on me. There we go, we're back to normal. You should be able to use the arrow keys to advance. Yeah. It didn't have them up for me at first. There we go. Should be all set now. Sorry for that. So as I said, um, and as Chris introduced me, I am this year's Fish and Wildlife Shorebird intern, Annalie Mears. Uh, and today, rather appropriately, I'm going to be presenting on the topic of shorebird and shoreline conservation. So let's get right into it. Waste no more time. So the focus of my uh, presenta presentation today is that um, conservation of the shoreline is what keeps our environment healthy, but also keeps our own personal beach days relaxing. Uh, our shorelines are used by many from us as humans to plants and animals. Uh, we use it for relaxation, recreation. Uh, plants use it as a place to grow. Animals use it for home and food protection uh, as a way to support future generations. Uh, however, our coastlines have been declining and are in need of revitalization. So here's some of what we as humans use this for. We use the beaches from the back shore to the sand, to the waves, from fishing, shell fishing, foraging, swimming, sunbathing, picnicking, bird watching, beach combing, hiking, and many more. Some of the most common ones are uh, fishing, swimming, and hiking. Most of our beaches actually have coastal forests behind them. Uh, so a lot of times people will go hiking out to a nice little beach, spend the day there, and head back. Uh, we have quite a few interesting fish that come in, some sport fish, uh, some good bait fish. We even have the occasional uh, sharks that come in. So uh, a sport fisherman might enjoy going out and hunting for thresher sharks. Most people use our beaches for swimming. Hot day, there's nothing better than going out and relaxing in the surf. Um, it's, it's quite a good time. So our Connecticut shoreline consists of quite a few different types of shorelines. We have our sandy beaches, we have rocky beaches, we have bluffs or cliffs, we have salt marshes, we have grasslands. 
Um, today, I'm mostly going to be focusing on our sandy beaches because that is what most people think of when they think of the shoreline and something that they would like to use. So a beach shoreline consists of a backshore, a foreshore, a nearshore, and an offshore, uh, which can be further divided. Behind the backshore is what is known as dunes. Now, dunes are very important, and I want you guys to keep this in mind as we go forward because I'm going to be mentioning dunes quite often. Uh, the dunes are kind of the buffer between inland and the, and the coastline, uh, and they're stabilized by the plants that grow on them. The root systems hold them together, but still allow them to move around. Now, our backshore and our foreshore is what we tend to use for sunbathing that consists of mostly sand, and then it is bordered by our rack line, which is the border of seaweed, uh, debris, shells, everything else that's washed up, which also serves as a good marker for our high tide line. Now, the near shore is our tidal zone or our tidal swash. That's ex essentially extends out to our uh, the start of the breakers, and everything beyond that is our offshore. Most of what we use is our tidal area, our near shore, and our foreshore. Um, we're going to head on to the next slide and continue to talk more about our friendly neighbors on the beach. So Connecticut is home to a variety of plants and animals, which includes um, quite a few interesting species of concern. So we have our cactus, which is our Eastern prickly pear. I was very excited to find out we had a cactus. Uh, that's usually found on more stable ground uh, alongside our seaside sandwort. Uh, and our endangered plant, which is the sickle-leaved golden aster. And I have a picture, unfortunately not in bloom, of that on a later slide. We also have our uh, diamondback terrapin, which lives most of its life, life in the brackish water, uh, which is quite an interesting um, species that is a little bit vulnerable at the moment. We also have quite a few insects from our migratory monarch, which you can see perching on that thistle, to our tiger beetles, which are down in the corner. And we have multiple different types of tiger beetles. Um, that is most likely an oblique lined tig tiger beetle, but we also have one that's called a festive tiger beetle that is red and green and rather metallic, uh, hence the name festive. We have horseshoe crabs, fiddler crabs, blue crabs, some invasives like mitten crab, uh, and we of course have our birds from the little, little blue heron, which is on the slide, to our great blue heron, egrets, osprey, and our shorebirds. So the shorebird lifestyle. As was mentioned earlier, there are four species that I focused on this summer, and all of these are ground nesting species. So what that means is they do not make nests, they create a scrape in the ground, so they dig out a little uh, hollow in the sand, and that is where they lay their eggs and have their chicks, and they spend all of their time there, which makes them a little bit more vulnerable, uh, seeing as how they are right in line with feet, and they don't have a lot of protection. So our species are the piping clover, which is up in the corner. It is a very, very small, very well camouflaged sandy bird. Our American oyster catcher, which is over in the corner, right next to our Canadian goose. It's about the size of a chicken. We have our least tern, which is our smallest tern, and we have our common tern, which is slightly larger. Uh, you can see the common tern in the bottom with its very cute little chicks. So because these guys are more vulnerable nesting on the ground, they rely more on camouflage and defensive techniques to protect themselves. So. I'm going to point out the picture down in the bottom right, I believe, corner, has three eggs in it. The larger one is the American oyster catcher egg, and the two smaller ones are the piping plover eggs, which were surprisingly found in the same nest. We think that the piping plovers abandoned their nest and the oyster catchers just moved right on in and kept the eggs there. So as you can see, uh, both of these eggs, uh, types of eggs are very speckled, and uh, they match that sand color very well. That is what keeps the eggs safe. Uh, and the chicks, as you can see in the bottom middle, are also speckled and often sandy colored. Uh, or in the case of the American oyster catchers, they're kind of rock colored. So the chicks will tend to hide rather than run away, while the parents will distract predators and threats from noticing their nest. Most of the time, it is rather defensive. They will they nest down in the open so they can see predators before the predators see them. They'll get up off their nest, which is called flushing, and they'll move away from it. Oyster catchers will get off as soon as they see you, and they will see you from a very long distance away. And it, that is meant to keep the predator in their nest. The predator will be attracted to the moving adult more than a stationary camouflage nest. Uh, piping plovers do some quite interesting techniques. They'll actually escort or walk beside the threat out of, 
out of their territory until it's a safe distance away and then return to their nest. Um, whereas oyster catchers will kind of just stay off and, and shout at you for a little while. They also do what is called a broken wing display where they pretend to be injured um, because an injured adult is a much better meal to a predator than a small egg is. So they'll tend to lead it away as far as possible and then they'll fly off as soon as, as soon as they are capable of doing so. And they'll kind of trick the predator into getting so far away it has no idea where their nest is. Least terns tend, at least terns and common terns tend to be a little bit more offensive though, and they make quite a stink, literally. Their best defense is dive bombing. Sometimes they will make contact like the common terns uh, or vomiting and pooping on the threat. It smells awful. It is a wonderful way to keep sensitive nose predators or just a human who doesn't want to smell like rotten fish away from a nest. It's quite unpleasant. <laughs> So with that in mind, I have some questions for you. Now, I want you to think about these questions and hold on to your answer as we go through uh, the presentation and kind of think back to it as we go. So what would the beach look like if all of this was gone, if all the plants and animals uh, were done? Would the beach and shoreline be damaged? Would it be unusable? Would it be gone entirely? Uh, what impact would this change have on your beach day relaxation or on coastal buildings or homes, towns, roads? Uh, I can give an example for this one. I love going to the beach because of the wildlife and because of the surf, uh, because of the, of the sand. And it's, it's very relaxing for me to just sit there and listen to everything going on around me. If the plants were gone and there was nothing to keep the sand stable, if the animals were gone, there's nothing for me to look at, not even seagulls flying around. Um, if that had changed the surf to the point where the waves were completely different or non-existent or too rough, I would be stressed out. I'd be wondering what's wrong with the beach. I'd be wondering why, it, why it's happening, what's going on. It would not be a relaxing day. And how would beaches degrade to this point? Um, uh, I want to add in another question here as well. Uh, think about times that you've gone to the beach and maybe it hasn't been what you expected. Maybe something has changed since the last time you've been there. Um, and is it even possible to get to this point? And as evidenced by this picture in the corner, that is an eroding dune. So yes, it is entirely possible. The main reasons or drivers behind uh, a degrading beach is disruptor, disrupted or altered coastal processes. Uh, so let's take erosion for a minute. Erosion is a big ticket word for a lot of people. It is a problem for a lot of people. But in reality, it's just a natural process that is neither good nor bad. When, you, when uh, steps are taken to mitigate or stop erosion is when erosion becomes a big problem. So let's think about it in terms of beach migration. Um, beaches actually move, which is something that I feel like a lot of the public does not know about, uh, mostly because it moves ever so subtly. So what it does is it will move inland in response to rising sea levels or changes in the tides. And the way it does this is through the all important wonderful dunes. So the dunes are stabilized just enough that they can hold and trap sand. And as the sea level comes further and further up the beach and eats away more of that sand at the beginning, more will be deposited in those dunes and swept backwards. So the dunes will move further back and open up more shore. So you have essentially the same amount of beach, even though it will fluctuate at a time, but it won't disappear. So long as there is space for that dune to move backwards inland and create this beach. This is stopped most often by coastal development and human disturbance. Dune degradation is a very big driver of this. One of the most uh, well-known is walking on the dunes and disturbing or killing off the plants. You kill off the stabilization, there's nothing to keep those dunes there, nothing to, to allow them to collect and um, distribute sand, nothing to allow them to move backwards and keep their shape. So once that is gone, it doesn't have that repository, I suppose, um, of built up sand to use and move through. Um, and if it, even if you do keep a very healthy dune, if you build too close, that dune has nowhere to go and it will degrade and erode away. 
So you get things like those wonderful pictures we've all seen of homes and boardwalks that are eaten away, the sand is eaten away all the way to the basin. Some of them are con condemned and they're falling into the ocean. Another big, I guess, problem with that as well is uh, beach armoring. So in response to seeing those pictures and not wanting their homes or their businesses to become another image, they'll, uh, people will put up seawalls. So I have a few images of seawalls and other hard structures here. We have a concrete poor seawall, which seems very nice to walk on, but there's no beach in front of it. You can kind of see in the background, there is a beach on the side. Uh, and we also have boulder seawalls as evidenced in the picture in the bottom left. Uh, in the middle is a groin or a jetty, which has a similar purpose of stopping erosion, but for a different reason. So the seawalls are meant to stop erosion from affecting homes and businesses, while the jetties are meant to stop the beach from eroding away. In reality, what they do is they end up having a buildup of sand on one side and further erosion on the other side. So really all they've, do they've done is shift the burden of erosion to a different area on the beach, which also happens with seawalls. Um, the erosion does end up going up to the seawall in a lot of places, but first it is directed off and around the sides. So you have heavier erosion on these sides of the seawall, which often prompts the need to build more of these revetments and bulkheads and seawalls. And that really just, it stops the erosion from getting to your house or your business or from undermining the roads, but it does not stop the erosion from taking away the beach that people want to protect. And a more, I suppose, natural but human caused or helped problem is invasive species. Uh, dunes need that stabilization, but invasive species that come in often stabilize it too much. So the root system will prevent that dune from moving and shaping and, and uh, responding to changes in the environment. You'll have a very nice big dune. It just won't move. It won't deposit any sand anywhere. And it will often change the habitats that are in or around those dunes and change the types of animals that can live there and the service that it provides to the ecosystem. Uh, we also have things that directly affect the shorebirds. So we have natural and invasive predators, wild and domestic. We have, of course, our herons, our black crown night herons, and our uh, great egrets and our great blue herons. Uh, but we also have things like otters and raccoons and uh, coyotes, weasels, and then some that are more attracted by people. So rats and opossums and skunks that are there looking for the trash left behind on beaches. We also have domestic cats that are let loose, they can wreak havoc on a shorebird uh, nesting grounds and dogs as well. Uh, it does not matter to a shorebird if a dog is on a leash or off a leash. Obviously, if it's off a leash, they'll be a bit more panicked because the dog is more likely to come up to them, but they will see a dog as a four-legged threat no matter what. And they often have a uh, larger response to a dog than they do a human. Now, what happens with that is they'll clear off their nest and they will not go back to it until that threat has passed. And most people will want to keep their dog on the beach. You know, you want to have a nice day with your pet and your family. Uh, and that can lead to further problems with either abandonment of the nest because the birds see it as an unsuitable environment to raise their young in, or the eggs or chicks, if they have hatched, will die of exposure because the parents will be off the nest too long. Uh, and the chicks or the eggs will be exposed to weather conditions for a much longer period of time than they should be. That can also be a result uh, due to increased human activity. So if you have high volumes of people on a beach, that's a lot of stressors for a bird, especially if they are very close to the nesting area. Uh, you also have people bringing vehicles on onto the beach. Uh, that can cause a huge noise disturbance, or it could run over some of the chicks or the birds that are not that don't get out of the way fast enough, especially the small chicks that people don't see. Pipe and clover chicks are like this big when they first hatch. They're like little pom-poms on stilts. We also have some more aerial threats like kites and drones. There was actually a very unfortunate incident in California where a drone crash landed on uh, a nesting ground for elegant turns and it 1,500 eggs. So that is 1,500 
terns that will not hatch and be added to the population or have the potential to be added to the population. Now, elegant terns can survive, uh, the population can survive an, issue, uh, an event like that. Uh, but imagine that happening to our threatened species here, our piping plovers and our least terns that really cannot handle that uh, number of deaths at one time in their, in their season. We also have our extreme weather events, uh, which can be further coupled by human activity. We love going to the beach on heat wave days because the beach is a great place to cool off. You have that wonderful coastal breeze, you have the surf, you can dive in, you can spend a nice day out there away from the, the heat of the inland. Too much activity can keep the birds off the nest. Even for a normal amount of time on a day of a heat wave, that can cook the eggs. Um, and even when days, even on days where there's extreme weather events that humans wouldn't be out there. So storm, uh, big storms, hurricanes, maybe there's a storm out at sea and we have storm surge coming up, that can be devastating to the population as well because it can sweep out nests, wash out nests, take the eggs straight out to sea, where obviously they cannot survive. It can take chicks, it can take adults, all of that wonderful sad stuff. So I've gone through all of this. Um, I've gone through the threats, I've gone through the issues that are faced, but why should we care about that? Why should we care about changing the way we approach these? Why can't we continue to enjoy ourselves at the beach and just put up arm armaments? Why can't we continue to try and reclaim the sea? Why can't we continue to try and nourish beach beaches and add sand and groom the beaches with raking, and add more seawalls and add more jetties and just keep that, that there through our own engineering? Well, one of the big reasons is that it really doesn't provide the protection that a natural shoreline would. So a natural shoreline has a, a good amount of beach and a dune system, again, back to the dunes, that acts as a wonderful buffer against things like storms and storm surges and severe weather. It is more resilient to those uh, issues than a seawall or, or a revetment is. Because what happens is there's more area between the inland and the shore, the uh, shore, or even houses in the inland and the shore, for that that storm surge to come up and kind of be stopped by those dunes and not uh, pose a, an enormous flood risk to homes and towns and businesses that are further in that are further inland behind dunes. Now, if you have a shorter beach and not as great of a dune system, the in, the the risk goes up. Another interesting thing about that too is while seawalls and revetments do in fact uh, help lower the risk of flooding due to storm surge, what they don't do is provide uh, a reduced risk of backwater flooding, which is what happens when you have a storm and it goes up into the, the creeks and the, and the rivers and the tidal areas that happen just behind the shoreline. Uh, if you have a healthy embankment, a healthy shoreline along all of that area, you get protection from all sides, from flood flooding from all sides. You also get protection from erosion. Having a natural shoreline means that erosion is just a natural process. It does not pose a threat to livelihoods and homes because your beach is simply ebbing and flowing with the rates of erosion. It's moving backwards, moving forwards. The, the bluffs or the dunes can take that, that change. Whereas if you're too close and it can't migrate backwards or you put up this armament that stops the cycle of the dunes completely, it just goes away. Uh, it can undermine all the roads in that area. It can undermine the houses. And, and quite honestly, it can erode away at that, the base of that seawall as well. It can create what's known as a scour at the bottom. Uh, which kicks up some pretty coarse sediment and kind of creates a, a dead zone. There's nothing that lives there. And that extra sediment is coming from the base of the seawall and the concrete, which will of course need fixing later on. Uh, this can also prevent dangerous shoreline. So kind of building off of that idea of erosion, when you have erosion as a problem, it does create dangerous shoreline. It can create um, dangerous cliffs that drop off or even grasslands that drop off. Uh, it can create areas that are much more rocky and sharp and not so great to be on. There's actually a place in Ireland that's having this issue right now. Uh, I apologize for any 
um, mispronunciation. The town is, uh, and it has a, or uh, the beach is Rosnalaga. It has a very wide area. It's a, it's a very popular surf spot, but it's covered in seawalls for the local businesses and private homes, uh, parking lots. And what has happened is the beach that used to be very wide, used to have a good dune system, used to have uh, a wonderful layer of, of sand is now much smaller and it diminishes every day. And it is a very thin layer of sand over top of bedrock and sharp stones. So if they don't continuously try and address the problem, the beach could just become a rocky shoreline. Uh, and the surf has been changing as well. Uh, so it has not always been a great surfing spot. Um, and that is continuing to go down and down, which is affecting the, um, the economy in that area that kind of relies on people coming in. Uh, a natural shoreline is also a haven for important species. And by important, I mean commercially important. A natural shoreline is often a nursery habitat for um, commercially important fish. So uh, let's take flounder because when I was on the way out to Manunk the other day, I think I stepped on a flounder. It was very scared and it ran away. But <laughs> flounder will often come inshore and, and um, they'll grow there. They'll spawn, everything will come in shore due to wave action and they'll grow in this area and they'll make their way out further as they uh, grow to adulthood. And that allows them to be used by that commercial fishery. Now, if their nursery spots go away, it becomes much more difficult for them to survive until adulthood, which directly impacts the commercial fishing industry, which means that they will have to resort to more harsh measures to catch that same amount of fish to put on in our stores and put on our plates. Uh, sometimes they'll move to a completely different species, which will then uh, affect that species and affect everything that feeds upon that species or is fed upon by that species. And it, it has a, cycle, uh, a chain effect as it continues on. Now, I had mentioned uh, a little, little while back that repair costs are often a concern with seawalls. Uh, having a natural shoreline reduces these repair costs. It reduces the costs in general. Uh, you might have to do some nourishing and some maintaining of anything that's offshore that's having some issues that was put in to protect a shoreline. But for the most part, it is much less expensive to have a natural shoreline than it is to have an armored shoreline. The cost per square foot to put in a seawall can, can be astronomical depending on the area that it has to cover and how wide it has to be. Even for a private homeowner to put it in, it can be upwards of $13,000, which is, that's, that's a lot <laughs> to put in for something that you'll have to repair after every single storm or five, 10 years down the line, every five, 10 years down the line as erosion hits it and, and works its way through it. Whereas a natural shoreline absorbs that and it bounces back from that much better than a seawall does. Uh, and to kind of add on to that idea of a dollar figure, having a natural shoreline can add greatly to property value. No one wants to look at a weathered old, beat down, dilapidated seawall or a jetty. They want to look at a natural beach. That is a big draw of coastal property, actually, is the view, is the waterfront view. Um, they want to see a healthy beach. They want to be able to walk out to it and use it from their backyard or their front yard. They want to see the wildlife and the plants. Um, it, it adds greatly to the, the property value in that area. Uh, continuing on to that, the view is just, it has, it has an economic value, but it also has uh, an intrinsic value of simply being something that is enjoyable to look at. Uh, it's, it's enjoyable to be in and be amongst. Uh, it has quite a lot of wildlife, like I mentioned a couple slides back, lots of birds, lots of interesting uh, water creatures, lots of things that we didn't know about, or at least I didn't know about until I, like, I didn't know about the Diamondback Terrapin until I took this internship. I was floored by the idea uh, that we have a brackish water turtle. Uh, having a, a nice sturdy shoreline is also great for recreation because it provides many more places for people to go and stretch out uh, and have fun and, and do their activities without rubbing elbows with their neighbors. I was on this beach one time 
and we always got there early so we had a prime spot but someone came and sat in front of us and they'd been building the sand turtle and like, oh that's really cool he was so close though that any anything he did we could hear it was not enjoyable and we ended up ha having to move a little bit to put that that uh nice space in between my family and their family. Um, having a large shoreline, usually you don't have that bumping your elbows with your neighbor every time you go to grab a sandwich. Uh, you also have a much more inviting beach as well. Uh, sand tends to change in a cycle. It goes from fine to coarse to fine to coarse back and forth, but you always have periods of fine sand. When you have an armored beach or a beach that is degrading, that sand often turns to a more gravel-like uh, consistency. It's not as enjoyable to be on. It does not feel as nice. Um, it's not, it doesn't bring in people the way that it should. Uh, and you often get people complaining about that. And they're like, oh, well, now we have to address that problem. And you get more beach armor and you get more of those structures that caused it. And having an after shoreline lasts much longer than having a seawall, especially when people don't want to take care of seawall anymore because it is, it is in constant need of repair. They're resilient to time, they're resilient to pollution, pollution uh, especially because a healthy shoreline often has healthy offshore habitats like seagrass beds, which are great at uh, pulling nutri extra excess nutrients out of the water and providing good water quality. They often have oyster reefs that do the same thing. Those just make it so that it is much safer to swim in the water uh, and we have less Less instances where the beach is closed down to, due to poor water quality uh, after storms. It just, it lasts longer with the water and it lasts longer with the sand and with the actual shoreline because it can adjust itself without the, the need to accommodate for an armored system that it really cannot move. So what are some signs to look for of a healthy shoreline? Again, are healthy dunes, dunes that have native plants and animals, uh, because native plants are what allows the dune to be stable, but also move and change, and native animals, because our native animals require native habitat to live. They need proper parameters for uh, that need to be met by the environment. Um, some, some more native plants, we have our American beach grass, which is down in the corner. Um, up in the top right corner is the sickle leaf golden aster. Like I said, it's not flowering, but I thought it would be nice to include a picture of that. It kind of looks a little, little bit like a small woody stem. It's not, but it looks a little bit. It reminds me of uh, rosemary uh, in, in the look of it. And then we have our beach pea with a nice little bumblebee on it, which is uh, was provided courtesy of Sean Roche. So thank you very much for that. It's uh, one of the be better images on this uh, presentation. And we have our yellow crown night heron, which you can see down in Milford. Um, they often hunt on the mud flats. I've seen them chomping down on fiddler crabs. It's very fun to watch. Uh, another sign of a healthy dune is dead snags and stones. And you might think, well, why is a dune healthy if it has a lot of dead things on it? And that simply means it's been there long enough for plants to go through a natural cycle of life and death. It's been there long enough for driftwood to have washed up to that point and settled on the dune. It's been there long enough for stones to be deposited. So it just means that that is a long-lived, well-adjusted, stable dune. It also provides more little areas for uh, things to hide and live and stay safe from predators, which is also what uh, varying amounts of plant cover provides, little microhabitats. So a uh, shorebird might nest in the dunes, but just outside of the heavily vegetated area, whereas a uh, smaller mammal might take its foraging grounds inside the dunes uh, in those heavily vegetated areas because they can avoid predators that way, whereas a shorebird to avoid predators has to see the predator before it sees them. Uh, and shorebirds are also, just, just the presence of shorebirds is a sign of a healthy shoreline because shorebirds and humans like the same type of beaches. We like wide beaches that have good dune system, a good tidal area, a good rack line, because for us that means this beach is nice to sit on, it's nice to enjoy, and it has a lot of area. And for a shorebird, that means that there are a lot of areas to forage, a lot of areas to nest without having a territorial dispute, and also a lot of areas to kind of take a lookout position. It's just a better quality habitat. It has better biodiversity. 
there's more uh, areas to forage, more area in general. So I've talked a little bit about all of those, why we should care, why we should look for these things. Now, what are people doing about it? What are the conservation plays? Well, I've talked quite a bit about armoring or hard protection, um, but it is a temporary solution. It can, be, it can be good in certain situations where we need to buy time to create a better solution and implement a better solution, but they're also very costly and they, and they cause more problems in the long run. Like I mentioned with shifting the burden, burden of increased erosion to other areas or causing that erosion, causing that coastal squeeze where the beach just diminishes and diminishes until it's completely gone. Now, a living shoreline or soft protection is, in my opinion, is a much better alternative. However, it is dependent upon the location and the characteristics of the site. It can't be implemented in the same way and it's in every area. But what a living shoreline or soft protection is, is the bolstering or creating of natural defense, defenses or a natural shoreline. In a lot of areas that can be creating a uh, small marshy habitat, um, an intertidal habitat, or it can be replenishment of dunes. So uh, we have this picture uh, where we have NOAA staff and volunteers planting beach grass on a dune to help stabilize it and help uh, create a, a better area for this beach to flourish. We also have, uh, it can also be implemented in private areas and private homes. You can have a small living shoreline that prevents erosion from taking away all the way up to your house and undermining your house's foundation and condemning it. And what that can often consists of is planting native vegetation, some edging that helps helps give that those plants a, a, a better chance of establishing before they're swept away or the root systems are swept away. Sometimes it also includes uh, a sill or just extra sediment, sediment along the edge. It can have an artificial oyster reef um, or the living shoreline, the soft protection can just be an artificial reef or a breakwater offshore um, that's meant to reduce wave action. So there's less of a, a crashing force taking away that beach, allowing that beach to kind of stabilize again. Uh, and often artificial reefs are put in place for oyster, natural oyster reefs to form. Uh, and they can be taken away as that natural reef becomes established. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to approach a living shoreline. Uh, and they can often be paired with temporary solutions like a seawall, um, though it will have to be removed eventually, or beach nourishment, which is adding sand to that beach to, uh, to give it more of that buffer while things establish, while things take place and be, are put into effect. Now for shorebirds, uh, we have a couple different types of conservation. Most of it is observation and monitoring and awareness. Uh, we have string fencing that's put up and the purpose of that is to keep uh, a barrier between prime habitat, prime nesting area and where humans are. Uh, it's more of a way to say, hey, there are birds here, keep your distance and keep your eyes out. It doesn't always work, but it does work a lot more than doing nothing. Uh, and we'll, often, we'll also implement exclosures. So down in the uh, bottom left middle area, we have an exclosure that's kind of been undermined by a channel at Harkness, uh, which is quite interesting. That was many, many feet away from the channel, which shifted all the way in. But that's a different story. That's that was just something I found interesting. Uh, so the exclosures are used exclusively for piping plovers. Uh, we can't use them for terns because terns will take off to get away from their nest rather than walk away from their nest. So it would pose more of a danger to terns. Whereas piping plovers, they can fit through the wire that's used for the exclosure. Whereas the majority of their predators, especially crows and coyotes and foxes cannot fit into that exposure. It keeps their nest safe, it keeps their babies safe, and it keeps them safe. Um, it also prevents accidentally stepping on a nest if it was put out, if the nest was made outside of the fenced area or if people, or if the nest, the fence gets knocked down and people go into the area. Um, something else that I've been really interested in that I haven't seen implemented in a lot of places, uh, but it's becoming more well known is uh, changes in coastal home design. So not only are places building farther back where they can, some new construction and old construction is being changed to put houses on silts 
or on things that make it more easy to move them out of the way. Uh, so the, the structure that was immovable becomes movable and can adjust to beach migration and create more area for that dune to move inland, uh, which I, I think is a wonderful way to marry the idea of people not giving up their, their property and still having people move inland. And then of course we have our shoreline cleanups, uh, just taking trash, extra pollution out of it. We have companies that are looking at ways and uh, developing ways to pull plastic and microplastic out of the water. We have people that are almost staining the beach uh, and taking out all those plastics. There's a lot of different cleanup efforts that go on. Uh, and that can be done on an individual level as well as a company or community level. The best things that we can do to help is to ask questions, to learn about conservation efforts in our local area and uh, on a large scale, uh, just kind of informing ourselves and, and learning about what the different techniques are, what the different tactics are, uh, what their drawbacks are, what their benefits are. Uh, before we go to areas, we can look up online and understand and follow the regulations and guidelines. Most uh, local public and state owned or federally owned beaches and areas have websites or other bulletins that are updated frequently, uh, especially after storms, uh, areas that are closed down, things like that. You can volunteer for cleanups or planning efforts or even just public outreach. Uh, so advertisements, there's always something interesting that's happen happening. Uh, and a good place to start is the Audubon Alliance. Uh, um, I have the website up on the PowerPoint. Uh, they always have training, they're always in need of monitors, they're always in need of something. Um, I actually work with quite a few people in the Audubon Alliance. Uh, Fish and Wildlife is part of the Alliance, I believe, for this internship. So I've worked with the state, I've worked with Audubon volunteers, I've worked with Audubon field techs, um, staff. It's been a wonderful experience seeing this, this uh, amount of people from various different organizations and communities come together and volunteer for the same goal. So as a wrap up, I hope I've made my point that conserving our shoreline is what keeps our environment healthy and also keeps our own days at the beach enjoyable. Um, the benefits of our conservation are a resilient land and ecosystems that prevent damage to our own property. We have protection against uh, the elements that is not provided by a human engineered solution. Uh, we have gorgeous views that are wonderful to look at, and for coastal homeowners, it boosts their property value. And our shorebirds are much happier when humans are taking them into account. So uh, I'm going to open it up to questions now. I'll be here uh, until the end time for this and a little bit past if we can manage it to uh, talk about it. Uh, and I have a, another little question for you guys. Um, did each ever look different? Than, uh, what, than you expected on a visit. I believe I asked this a little further back. We can talk more about it now. Uh, we can discuss ways that it could be fixed. Yeah, so uh, we're going to use the hand raise function. So at the bottom of your screen, there should be a couple of icons. One of them says reactions. Um, and if you click on that, you should have a little hand raise. So I'm gonna go back into the Zoom meeting and I should be able to see the order in which people did that. And you could unmute yourself and ask the question or you could type it in chat, either one works. I can get back into the regular Zoom. Oh dear, I have no idea how to stop sharing this. <laughs> Top of the screen. Okay. Oh, there it is. Wonderful. All right. Now I'm back in here and I should be able to see the host might actually be the one that can see hand raises. If you go to gallery view, you can. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much. All right. I'm in gallery view.
So I'll, I'll start out with a question. What, what was the um, best part of your internship? Best part of my internship? Um, I think that's actually a tie for me between meeting so many people that are like-minded and are interesting to work with and have interesting information to share and um, actually seeing the birds from the chicks all the way up to their adulthood. It's been very amazing and astounding to go out to a beach and see a hatching in progress or see the, the little plovers running around and foraging as a chick, seeing them take their first hop, stretch their wings for the first time, see them take flight for the first time. I was never, I never went out to a beach and thought, oh, this, this old same thing again. I always was astounded by the birds and almost humbled by seeing, seeing their lifespan um, and their, their life history play out before me. It was, it was amazing. I loved that part. And what was your favorite bird? My favorite bird? Um, I don't really know. <laughs> I really enjoyed them. Um, the favorite bird that I saw was probably the little blue heron or the glossy ibis because I didn't see them very often and they were very interesting to see. But the favorite focal species, it would, it would probably be the oyster catcher because they're very funny little birds. And the chicks go through uh, a very, very awkward teen phase where they're so ugly, they're cute. Um, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> they looked spiky when their new feathers were growing in. Anybody else have questions? Yeah, I have a question. I'm sorry, I can't figure out how to raise the hand. That's all right. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, a, a big issue that we face in the conservation movement is that of environmental justice. And our beaches and our, our shorelines have been a prime um, example and Connecticut has a really bad history of excluding certain demographics from access to beaches uh, either by having um, um, permits that are issued by the, the towns that have um, a certain um, demographics and uh, people from inner cities aren't able to get in um, so that, uh, can you speak something about that? Because um, if we are trying to preserve the, the beaches, we have to do it both for animals and also to get um, as many people in there as possible so they have the benefits and hopefully we'll have some environmental warriors coming from these groups that have better access to our natural spaces. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, always, I, I was always uh, of the mindset that conservation should not just be about uh, the natural world. It should also be about how we use it and how we see it, uh, especially because a lot of people don't view it as simply something that we should conserve for the sake of it. They see it as something that we should conserve because we enjoy using it and we live there. And as far as um, the historical ex exclusion of certain demographics, uh, people who are farther away from the coast and don't get down very often. Uh, I lived, I wasn't in an urban area, but I did live uh, in the middle of the state. We only got to the beach a couple times a year. I think it's very important that we um, continue outreach programs that are going on right now. I don't know a lot of ways to fix it, uh, unfortunately. I do know that uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, they have an intern every year that is um, uh, like an urban conservation uh, kind of internship um, where it focuses more on uh, inner city and urban areas and trying to get more people in from those areas interested. Um, and really, I think the best way that we can continue to involve people who don't get to the beach very often or involve people who don't have access to the beach is um, continuing programs like that, continuing to reach out and, in, and purposefully try to involve those communities. Um, back when I worked at Connecticut Sea Grant, the Long Island Sound Blue Plan was going on. And I think that was a great start to that uh, because uh, one, of the, one of the parts of setting that up was actually contacting 
communities along the water, communities that use the water or had historical use of the water and involving not just the town itself or the business itself, but private citizens. Uh, and something like that could be extended further uh, with an outreach program. Um, I think it's a complex issue that I don't have all of the answers for, but it's definitely something that should be pursued with more vigor and uh, have more attention placed on it. Well, Craig, you figured out the reactions. <laughs> Anybody else? Very well organized program, Emily. Thank you very much. I, I enjoyed giving it. It always makes me nervous, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad people turned out. And uh, I'm glad I've had some engagement and uh, was able to sit and talk with you guys for a little while. You are now an educator. That's what this is all about. Yeah. <laughs> That's where the environmental justice mm -hmm. uh, elements also can be educating people both on the shoreline and, and inland. Yeah. Uh, I hope, uh, Lori Reynolds, I hope that there's something that can be taken from this. Um, and, and used in a, a broader sense as well from uh, communities that maybe are dealing with things well or communities that are dealing with things in an inappropriate way or in a way that, or simply they don't know how to deal with uh, the issues that are presented or the population that's growing or um, any of the issues that are affecting them. I hope that these, these ideas can turn into lessons and solutions that are applicable across the board. Issue that uh, uh, the coastline of Connecticut does not have a lot of sandal and the geology, the bedrock geology, does not uh, provide a lot of materials that could become the sandy beach materials. So that's really kind of a limiting factor. Mm -hmm. there, there are some interesting geological. Uh, things that go on with our shoreline that are kind of unique to this, this side of the US. That's right. <laughs> All right, I guess we, we can uh, end it here since there are no more questions. Uh, right. We'll be back uh, Wednesday with another lunchtime with uh, interns talking uh, about global and local threats to seabirds with another mm -hmm. intern, Adam Hamishoy. So hope to see you then. If you're not registered for that program, register on the Monarch Duck website. And uh, thank you, Emily, for a, a great presentation. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Thank you for hosting this, Dennis. That was a big help.